During the pandemic, was there ever a time you or your family went to the grocery store and the item you were looking for wasn't there? Or you heard about the supply chain for a product being disrupted and wondered what that really meant? In this video, we're going to address these questions to better understand what is a supply chain and why supply chain disruptions occurred during the pandemic, specifically in food supply chains. Let's first start with what is a supply chain. A supply chain is a network of suppliers, manufacturers, distributors, logistic providers, and retailers that all work in unison to produce and deliver the goods we buy and use as consumers. A supply chain captures the journey a product takes as it is converted from raw materials into usable components into a fully functional product that is ready to sell to consumers. Here we have a picture of a supply chain. It shows the steps a product typically goes through as it's transformed from raw material to final product. The picture provides a nice overview for classroom use, but the reality is it oversimplifies things a lot. Most global supply chains are complex networks made up of multiple tiers of hundreds and thousands of different manufacturers and suppliers across the globe, each producing and distributing different components that eventually make it into the final product. This image shows the supply chain for a laptop computer and all the different stops each of the components makes across the globe before finally being assembled into a computer. Pretty complex, right? That's what makes supply chains really challenging and really fun to study. They're massive, they're global, and not easy to coordinate since they involve hundreds of different companies, each with their own objectives. Now you can start to imagine how all it takes is one or two links in the chain to have issues, and this could really cause havoc in the whole supply chain. Now let's talk about food supply chains. They too are complex and hard to coordinate. They also have some unique challenges to them. In its simplest form, the U.S. supply chain starts with feed and supplies, moves to farms, both crop and livestock, and then processing facilities, packaged good facilities for vegetables, and meat packing for meat. It's then trucked to a distribution warehouse, and then finally shipped to either restaurants or grocery stores. The first big challenge to food supply chains is, of course, the perishability of the items. Unlike a laptop or a pair of sneakers, food items typically have very short shelf lives. While this was a considerable challenge in the 18 and 1900s, over time, we have continually gotten better at managing this with improved transportation networks and improved methods for preserving goods such as refrigeration. Another challenge is the demand for food. There's always been a fear that the population growth would outpace the food supply growth. Again though, we found ways to overcome this and produce more than enough calories to feed the world, although we do still struggle to distribute the calories and starvation remains a critical issue around the globe. We've achieved this through innovations such as improved fertilizers that increase crop yields and operational specialization, both in what we produce and how we produce it. For example, countries have become more specialized in what foods they produce, and as a result, the global exporting of foods has dramatically increased five-fold since the 1990s. In 2020, almost 25% of all foods cross borders. In terms of how we produce, over time we have seen a consolidation throughout food supply chains as the Midwestern small family farm has gone away in favor of large corporate farms with greater economies of scale. Similarly, food processors have consolidated. For example, in 2020, only 50 beef plants accounted for 98% of all beef production in the U.S. As food supply chains have become more industrial, the efficiencies gained through specialization have helped to continually drive down the cost of food for American families year after year as shown in this graph. Unfortunately, there are potential side effects to these efficiencies and they came back to haunt us when the pandemic hit. Once the pandemic hit, we quickly felt the drawbacks of having specialized food supply chains. For example, globally countries such as the Ivory Coast and Ghana, who are world leaders in the export of cacao for chocolate, saw a decrease in demand for their cacao as consumers focus their limited resources on essential foods. Furthermore, they struggle to import essential foods such as wheat and rice as global shipping shut down and countries around the world began to impose restrictions on the export of their own goods. Here in the U.S., operational decisions that helped to reduce the cost of food for American families during good times actually handcuffed our food supply chains during the pandemic. For example, farmers who provide specialized goods that only sold in restaurants struggled as consumers stopped eating out. Furthermore, these fresh foods that restaurants purchased could not easily be sold in the supermarket channel, nor could these foods be easily preserved, leading to large amounts of food waste. 
In the meat industry, refrigerated delivery trucks that have been designed to specifically deliver to one type of channel could not easily be adapted to serve the other channel. Furthermore, grocers weren't well equipped to process restaurant-style bulk cuts in the first place. In the meat processing industry, facilities struggled to keep workers safe and infection rates down. This is because the industry is very labor intensive with workers often working shoulder to shoulder along the production line. As infection rates rose, facility shutdowns across the United States and the reduction in capacity this caused led to meat processors to becoming the bottleneck in the supply chain. This proved particularly problematic because of how concentrated the industry had become. For example, in the beef processing industry, four large companies control 80% of the beef production. One large beef processing plant alone shutting down was estimated to result in the loss of 10 million beef servings a day. Because of these shutdowns, the price of meat in the grocery store skyrocketed. In the end, the same operational improvements that helped us to increase our food supply and lower the cost of food for families turned out to be our downfall during the pandemic. We had created an efficient, cost-effective supply chain, but not one that was agile and able to react quickly to uncertainty in demand and supply. In today's increasingly complex world, where global supply chains are at risk of being disrupted not only by pandemics, but also events such as climate change, wars, cyber attacks and political unrest, agility is a must-have trait for effective supply chain management. So how do we fix this? How do we create more agile, resilient food supply chains that will be ready the next time we face a challenge like the pandemic? This is a popular topic of debate, of course, right now in industry and the government. Can we rely on the government and policy to fix the issues? While the desire seems to be there to improve our supply chains, most politicians are not well versed on supply chains and they tend to have to jump from fire to fire. For example, just as the pandemic started to recede here in the US, a war started between Russia and the Ukraine. What about industry and big players in the food supply chain such as Tyson? While the resources and knowledge are there, it will require someone to step up and take the lead. This is easier said than done in a supply chain context that is made up of hundreds of thousands of different players with no single leader who necessarily dictates what is going to happen. For a company such as Tyson, for example, to fix the food supply chain will require Tyson to step outside its four walls and expend resources up and down the supply chain to improve things, all while potentially Tyson's competitors sit back and benefit from Tyson's efforts. So that brings us to our third option. How about you? There is a huge opportunity in this space to think outside the box and reinvent the way our food supply chains work. Supply chains are often not designed, but instead they evolve into the big, difficult to manage behemoths we know of today. Trying to fix the existing supply chains will be difficult and may not be the answer. Instead, the more effective solution may be to start from scratch and build from the ground up. For example, many, including myself, have argued that we need to emphasize more local and regional supply chains as potential sources of food supply. Are there ways to create greater scale with our local sources of supply? There's a big opportunity to make improvements in our food supply chains. The problems are challenging, almost overwhelming, but the satisfaction from making a difference will be even greater. Welcome to NC State. It's an exciting time to be here on campus. Your path is yours to make.